Tonight, Reel to Reel takes to the air with a look at an airborne ambulance team. Then back on the ground, we'll see how a Chicago community is fighting gang violence. Father Joseph Martin discusses the meaning of worship and adoration in our daily lives. Mike Gallagher shoots some holes in the popular TV show, Miami Vice. And Father Tom Legere will be along to talk about pleasers. Hello, I'm Isabel Galvery. And I'm Father Dave McAllen. Welcome to Reel to Reel. Good evening and welcome back to Real to Real. And welcome back to you, Belle. How was your vacation? It was wonderful, but you know, while it was great to get away, I miss being here with you and with our viewers. Well, it's good to have you back. It's not easy doing a show alone. And tonight we have good news for all our Father Tom Legere fans. The special shows we did last fall with Father Tom at Villanova University were so popular that we've decided to bring them back for an encore performance. We appreciate all the cards and letters you sent telling us how much you enjoyed his full-length talks. We will hopefully be doing new shows in the near future, but until then, we want to give you another chance to see the original shows, just in case you missed them the first time around. We'll present the first part of Father Tom's talk on our spiritual journey at the end of this month on February 26th. But right now, let's get started with our show. Up first tonight, we have the story of a Florida-based group of paramedics flying high to save lives. or sense of urgency involved with the type of flights that we have. And you know that um, in some cases, you know, somebody's life may depend upon you being able to get to them. Got it. They have a lot of death by stupidity. And people always figure out new ways to kill themselves. Everything that I've been taught and everything I've strived for as a nurse, I'm using now, everything. I really feel like I'm on the front line now. They're dedicated to a five-minute takeoff. They pay a lot of attention to the amount of time they spend at the scene. Their main purpose is to save precious minutes, even seconds, that mark the difference between life and death. They're called ACT, Air Care Team, a group of highly trained, highly skilled emergency medical specialists of the Orlando Regional Medical Center. Their helicopter is a heavy-duty aerial ambulance whose pilot literally plucks the injured and dying from the scene of tragedy. Gary Cochran is one of three pilots on the ACT team. Military, specifically Vietnam flying, gives him the experience and coolness to deal with the urgent and unfamiliar. The type of uh, operations that we have where we're flying over large, what I call desolate areas, the Ocala Forest, uh, and also over rural or urban areas such as uh, Orlando. You know, the number of forced landing areas that are available to you if you do have a problem are very limited in those situations. And therefore the twin engines provide us with a lot of extra safety. We work under adverse conditions often. Um, weather can be a big factor. So there's a lot of pressure on the pilots from that respect. Um, if we take off and we have marginal weather conditions, you know, it takes somebody with some experience and some feelings of their own sense of um, abilities to know just how far to go and then say, that's enough, you know, I'm not going to risk myself and the crew that I have with me. I try not to get too involved with the patient. Um, you know, I don't feel like I can exercise good judgment if I get too wrapped up in what the patient's condition is. The patient is the concern of paramedic Elmer Holt. The, uh, the paramedic was brought on the team because we have the, the expertise and the experience in working on the scenes. 
whereas the, the, their nurses from the in-hospital have the expertise and the experience of working in-hospital. Whenever we go to a scene, um, the uh, paramedic will go to the scene first while the nurse... Holt comes to ORMC from years working on the scene with the Orange County Fire Department. We transport a lot of children, and again, because of the nature of the business, everybody we carry is, is critical, and, and with few exceptions. And uh, so I'm carrying probably four times as many kids that I ever came in contact with in, in the scene work. Ten years in hospital emergency rooms, and nurse Sandy Frazier thought she'd seen everything. For her, the main difference in ACT is the pressure of being alone. Well, my first fight was a five-minuter. It's what we call a swoop and scoop, where you're up and you're down. And I was scared to death. Um, the report that we got in is many times much different from what you see. Many times it's much worse than what you see. And so we really didn't know what to expect. And we were, you know, the first flight, and we were afraid people were going to be really watching us. And a lot of things were going through my mind. But basically, I was afraid of myself. I thought, gee, all this training, am I going to be able to do it? It's, is it going to show, or am I going to get out there and botch it? They call it the golden hour, the time it takes to communicate the need, signal to scramble, lift off, pick up, and return to the trauma center. For a critically injured person, the time it takes to die. We got there and they were extricating from the vehicle. The steering wheel showed a uh, massive deformity. I'm figuring some type of chest injury on him. Uh, his level of consciousness has been changing constantly. They said the uh, paramedics first on the scene said he was unconscious initially. Had a good BP. It was like 102 over 86. And when they extricated him, the BP dropped out. They lost him down to about 70 by palpation. They didn't have him on a monitor at that time, so I didn't really know if he EKG with it at all. I don't know that any one person plays any more important role than anybody else. We each have our things that we do in certain times that becomes the most important thing that's going on. But um, in the entire mission, um, you know, the medical crew, the dispatchers, everybody, the, the doctors, they all have equally important roles because it just wouldn't function without anybody if anyone was missing. Anyone was. It's the kind of work that tries even the sharpest skills, steadiest nerves, and strongest faiths. And it was the Epcot crash that we had at Epcot, and we picked up the baby. And it was my first baby in the field. Um, it was just very traumatic. No, you get this white knight syndrome, you know, you're going to go out there and you're going to do it, and everything they've trained you. And nothing that we did, nothing did anything and I was really I was having a very hard time with that and we brought the child in and we took it to the emergency room and we brought it to the trauma team and the helicopter was really a mess so it was imperative that we get away immediately and prepare in case we got another call and when we went back up to the room somebody had found the baby's little shoes and they had taken them and stuck them by our door where we keep all our supplies and I went up there and I saw them up until that point I was doing really good and I think I'll just never forget that these little blood-stained shoes that were sitting by the door, and it just, I had a, I was pretty bummed out for the rest of the day over that. But that always stands out because the, I was doing really well until I saw the shoes. I particularly have had a strong background in, in the Catholic Church, and, um, and that, just that support uh, as you're growing up, you know, you, you knowing that, that uh, you have, or, you know, you, have, you can have a faith to fall back on. It. You get to a point where you've done everything, and his name comes up. It's like, well, it's in the hands of God, and we all recognize that. These people would seem remarkable for doing just what we've described so far, but what they do beyond that makes them truly extraordinary. So, anything? Have you heard any more about moving? No more. 
Jim Corbett doesn't remember his rescue from a plane crash that claimed the life of his friend. But the ACT team faithfully visits him. It didn't occur to me much until I kind of woke up, you know, and, and really was um, coherent enough to know what was going on. And then it, it was just seemed like a real something special extra. You know, I, I didn't expect them to come see me. The list goes on and on. Education of service groups, training with other emergency teams, meeting, visiting, caring, and always being ready to take off at less than a moment's notice with life literally at stake. It's an indescribable feeling to have someone that you reach that is essentially dead and know that they've walked out of the hospital because of your efforts. I especially like the fact that I feel like I'm I'm saving lives. I am saving lives. We are saving lives. Air care is saving lives. It's really good to see stories like that from time to time. We can never give enough credit or praise to those who are willing to put their life on the line for others. We're going to take a short break. Coming up, we have Father Tom Legere with Relationships and a look at Chicago's battle against gang violence. So stay with us. May 2nd, 1986, and you're just beginning the experience of a lifetime on the 1986 Reel to Reel Tour of Europe. Join Father Dave McGowan for a 16-day visit to places you've heard about but thought you'd never see. The mystique of Milan, luxurious Lucerne, bustling Munich, exciting Innsbruck, romantic Venice, the culture of Florence, and of course Rome, including a papal audience. All this and much more is part of the all-inclusive package. For a brochure and more information, call 215-565-7070. Charity in action is a heartwarming sight. In South Jersey, the House of Charity relieves hardship for thousands of men, women, and children. Through its agencies, retarded children receive special education. Medical treatment goes to the poor. Concerned workers care for the elderly. Young people are counseled on drug and alcohol abuse. And the physically handicapped receive training. Support the House of Charity in South Jersey. And touch someone's life with love. In any major city with a large economically mixed population, there are sure to be street gangs. And unfortunately, what goes hand in hand with urban street gangs is urban crime. Chicago is currently fighting its worst wave of gang violence in over 50 years. Ending the violence means getting gang members involved in nonviolent activities. And the Colby House Prison Ministry is doing just that. Consider the facts. Chicago has an estimated 110 street gangs, with a total membership exceeding 10,000. In 1984 alone, 98 of the deaths in that city were gang-related. But it took the senseless slaying of a high school basketball star to bring the city of Chicago together. That's when the prison ministry at Colby House, under the direction of the Archdiocese of Chicago, began a prevention and education program. Father Larry Craig is the director. The gang education teams, uh, as the name you know, would imply, work solely at education. They're not on the street you know, breaking up gang fights, and, and really they don't deal with gang members as such very often at all. They're interested in prevention of crime, in, in those families that are hurting because they've been victims of gangs or because their children are in gangs. That's their interest. The four-member team gives talks and works with neighborhood children. Team member Joe Alleman was once himself a gang member. I feel that kids nowadays, they need a positive role model. And a lot of our kids in, in the cities are not getting positive role models. Here I'm wearing a cub hat. Even nowadays, they're, they're indicting you know, police officers, they're indicting uh, baseball players. You know, so kids don't know who to turn to. There's no you know, like uh, Mickey Mantle or nothing like that no more. Some of them kids, when they came into the program, they couldn't hit at all. They didn't even know how to stand. They didn't even know how to hold a bat. And they didn't know how to run bases. They didn't know. And now they do. Hey! Now, we found out that gangs here in Chicago have been around since the 1920s, OK? 1926, to be exact. When we give talks to the kids, I know that the information 
to what we're giving them is good. Even if we talk to 200 kids and say that uh, 199 of them are not going to be in a game, but there's one of them that's going to maybe sway that direction. And then we've maybe deterred him from wanting but to join a gang, or we made him think twice about joining a gang, and that's an accomplishment. It's kind of tough. It's even in daylight, you know, it's sometimes dangerous to just walk out because, you know, at any time they, you know, they're usually all together, and, you know, once they see someone, you know, they, they'll just beat them up. I'm scared, you know, because, like, they might beat me up or, you know, they might take it on my family or something like that. The gang education program is trying to accomplish several things. One is teaching kids how to spend time constructively, off the streets and away from gangs. They learn about, hopefully, nonviolent conflict resolution, you know, which is something that we need all over the country, but we certainly need in these neighborhoods for kids to grow up and find other ways to work out disagreements without killing each other. Do you ever find yourself going crazy trying to please everyone around you? Well, here's Father Tom Leger to talk about that kind of person known as the pleaser. Greetings in the Lord. Sunday afternoon dinner at our family's home is a thing to be experienced. We discuss practically everything under the sun. And sometimes the discussions get pretty hot and heavy. But nevertheless, we remain closely knit as a family. What is our secret? Very simply, we give each other the permission to be ourselves. Now that may not sound like such a big deal, but not everyone has that space to be themselves. Instead, they're always going around trying to please other people. Now, to some extent, we all make an effort to be agreeable and get along with others. But when we get things out of perspective and derive our very significance as persons based on whether or not we happen to be acceptable to other people, well, that's when things are way out of focus. The pleaser is someone who is always lonely and unhappy. They are lonely because they're always afraid of expressing what they really fear feel for fear of being rejected. The pleaser is someone who is unhappy for the simple reason that you can never please everyone. What the pleaser needs is an equal dose of humility and unconditional love. Humility gives us the permission to make mistakes, even to fail, because we know that when we do fail, it's not the end of the world we know that we are still okay. And we get that sense of being okay from unconditional love. And that is God's gift to us. When we know deep inside ourselves that we are beautiful, then we no longer feel under this compulsion to please other people at all times. What, in fact, was the attitude of Jesus concerning pleasing other people? Interestingly enough, Jesus was not at all concerned with pleasing other people. In fact, there are many instances in the scriptures in which he displeased other people very, very much. But yet he had such a living experience of the Father's love for him that he was no longer dominated or controlled by this compulsion to please other people. Now, if, on the other hand, we're the kind of people who always insist on pleasing other people, well, we may get along okay in this world. But on the other hand, we may end up losing our souls in the process. As always, if you'd like a transcript of Father Legere's message, write us here and we'll be happy to send you one. We'll have an address and phone number for you at the end of the show. We're going to take another short break. Coming up, we have Father Joseph Martin with some thoughts on worship and adoration in our lives. And Mike Gallagher will be along to bust Miami Vice. So stay with us. At the Donahue Funeral Home, we're always gratified to hear from the families we serve. 
Over the years, many bereaved families have told us how much they appreciated the warm, home-like atmosphere of the Donahue Funeral Home. To make such moments perhaps a little less difficult, the Donahue Funeral Home suggests that you discuss with us now, in the privacy of your home, pre-arrangement and the financial advantages and peace of mind it brings. That's what living is all about. From the river to the ocean and everywhere in between, the Diocese of Trenton lives in its parishes, people, homes, and schools. And the Monitor newspaper is your way to keep aware of the renewal of the diocese. Lively features, accurate news reports, and columnists with something to say. Read the Monitor to find out what's happening in your church, from around the world, throughout the diocese, in your parish, from the ocean to the river. To subscribe, call area code 609-586-7400. How often do you show appreciation to the one who's given you everything? Here's Father Joseph Martin to talk about worship in our lives. The last time I was with you, we were speaking about the virtue of religion as being that which makes us render to God what is God's, just like the virtue of justice makes us render to Caesar or mankind what is his. I have obligations to you. I have to respect you in the sense that, number one, I can't kill you, I can't steal from you, I can't lie about you, I can't take what is yours, and I can't covet what is yours. When it comes to God, I have certain obligations to Him. I have to adore Him, to thank Him, to express sorrow, and to ask. All together, that constitutes worship. Now, just this time, I'd like to talk about adore, adoration. I wonder how many of you parents have been uh, really hurt and uh, worried and upset when your children say, well, no, I don't go to church anymore because I don't get very much from it. Well, the idea of going to church is to give. It's to pay a debt that I owe. I always kind of compare going to church on Sunday to paying one's bills, let's say the phone bill. Now, when you pay your phone bill, you can get an awful kick out of it. You can grin and tap dance while you do, but you don't have to. You just have to pay it. What is adoration? It is the intellectual acknowledgement that God is my creator and he made me and everything else out of nothing. Now, uh, a stone or a blade of grass acknowledges God simply by existence. It is and God is, so it proclaims God's glory just by existing. But I have an intellectual life. I can know that. And all he wants me to do is acknowledge it. You are my God. You have made me out of nothing. That is adoration. And my friends, that is the primary purpose for which you go to church on Sunday. Uh, it's the primary purpose of all prayer. And all prayer should begin with, I adore you, my God. Then take it from there. And we will take it from there the next time and go into the other three parts of worship. The hottest show of 1985 and maybe 1986 is Miami Vice. I think the only magazine that did not have Don Johnson on the cover was National Geographic. The show's popularity is built on slick visuals, modern music, high action, and a not always subtle depiction of sex. It seems like everyone is singing its praises, so guess who has a problem with it? Mike Gallagher. Hello, I'm Mike Gallagher. I recently read a story in a Catholic paper that somewhat depressed me. It seems that a pastor down in Florida turned his church over to the Miami Vice people so that they could film a scene involving a baptism. Now, why did I get depressed? Why can't I lighten up? Is it Miami Vice the big time? Weren't Philip Michael Thomas and Don Johnson on the cover of Time magazine, those cool cops in the hot show? Why shouldn't this pastor be delighted that all these glamorous people wanted to drag their lights and cameras and cables and coffee-making machines into his little church and so transmute the familiar, the everyday, the drab into something that shone with the magic luster of Hollywood? Why am I depressed? Well, let's take violence, something that many respected thinkers believe to be a plague upon American society. Miami Vice is chock full of it. Then let's take sex. Let's take it, that is, before Miami Vice uses it all up. In the two-hour season opener set in New York, our cool cops try to bring to justice some nasty drug dealers. They get no cooperation from the law enforcement locals. But fortunately, when at shootout time in old Manhattan, someone does stand by them, firing away with a business-like two-handed grip. It's Valerie, an old girlfriend of Ricardo's. After the smoke clears, Valerie, an undercover agent, 
goes under the covers once more, this time with Ricardo, and the two have an exchange of fire of their own, a pretty fierce one. The attentive camera stays at shoulder level, but within that purview, the action is hot and heavy. And as an extra Philip, there's some ingenious camera work featuring two bare feet of varying sizes and hues, twitching in the air and caressing each other, right in your own front room. Despite this outlay of passion, however, despite Valerie's prowess with the foot, the next morning we see Ricardo dashing off to the airport to rejoin Sonny for the flight back to Miami. Sonny, of course, would do the same for Ricardo. In one episode, for example, he tarries too long a bed one morning with a woman he thinks might be his true love, and Ricardo, left on his own, gets worked over by two hoods. And so the remorseful Sonny forthwith breaks up with the woman, and since she's a really good sport, they outdo each other in saying how meaningful and enriching the experience has been. Just as nobody, nobody important that is, gets hurt by flying bullets on Miami Vice, so too, despite the intensity of the sexual fireworks, Nobody ever gets hurt by flying emotions either. Thus, episode after episode drives home the lesson that sex with no strings attached is a liberating and fulfilling experience. That translates to this. Here we have one of the nation's top television shows, and in some very important respects, it stands in sharp contradiction to the Christian sensibility and Christian moral values. But does anybody care? Our pastor down in Florida doesn't, and I'm afraid he has lots of company among those who should know better. I'm Mike Gallagher for Arts Review. Since September, we've been dropping subtle hints here and there about a tour of Europe with you, our viewers. In case you haven't heard about it, I'll be your host on a beautiful two-week tour of countries like Switzerland, Germany, Austria, Liechtenstein, and Italy. The trip will begin on Friday, May 2nd. You'll travel and dine in timeless European cities like Milan, Lucerne, Munich, Salzburg, Pisa, Rome, and much, much more. Then return on Sunday, May 18th. For more information, contact us here and we'll be happy to send you a travel brochure. Write us here at Real to Real, 222 North 17th Street, Room 907, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, 19103. That's Real to Real, 222 North 17th Street, Room 907, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, 19103. Or call us during business hours at 215-668-9842. That's 215-668-9842. And tonight on our community bulletin board, next Sunday, February 9th, is World Marriage Day. Parishes around the Delaware Valley are sponsoring liturgies and special events to help you celebrate the sacrament of marriage. For more information, call your local parish or contact Marriage Encounter at these numbers. Next week on Reel to Reel, we'll hear the brave words of Bishop Desmond Tutu, recorded in Washington during a recent visit to the U.S. And we'll meet an Arlington, Texas man who has conquered his own disabilities through computers and gone on to develop computers to help others. Father Joseph Glass will talk about early missionaries in New Jersey. And Rosemary Bruno will be along with In the Know. So join us again next week. Good night. Good night. And remember, Jesus is Lord. Travel arrangements for Reel to Reel by Atkinson and Mullen Travel of Media PA. Phone area 215-565-7070. For years, a group of priests have met for prayer every Thursday evening. Now, our priest group invites you to be with us this Thursday, February 6th, and every first Thursday for our prayer meeting and Mass. We gather at Incarnation 5105 North 5th Street, just above Roosevelt Boulevard. The prayer meeting begins at 7.30 and the Mass at 8 p.m. The Lord and I hope to see you there.